Share your vision for maximum impact. When you've finished writing down your vision, share your vision with a good friend whom you can trust to be positive and supportive. You might be afraid that your friend will think your vision is too outlandish, impossible to achieve, too idealistic, unrealistic, or materialistic. Almost everyone has these thoughts when they think about sharing their vision. But the truth is, most people, deep down in their hearts, want the very same things you want. Everyone wants financial abundance, a comfortable home, meaningful work they enjoy, good health, time to do the things they love, nurturing relationships with their family and friends, and an opportunity to make a difference in the world. But too few of us readily admit it. You'll find that, when you share your vision, some people will want to help you make it happen. Others will introduce you to friends and resources that can help you. You'll also find that each time you share your vision, it becomes clearer and feels more real and attainable. And most important, every time you share your vision, you strengthen your own subconscious belief that you can achieve it. From Living at the Mission to Living His Mission in July 2010, Logan Doughty was sitting outside a homeless shelter, awaiting intake into a long-term no-frills recovery program. He had recently hit rock bottom due to alcohol and drugs. His parents and siblings wouldn't take him in, and he couldn't control his drinking or his temper long enough for anyone to do anything more than show him the door. He was emotionally spent, physically tired, and seriously stressed. As the months went by at the rescue mission, his head slowly began to clear, and with the help of a twelve-step program plus kind but strict Christian souls, he began to believe he might recover from this devastating chapter in his life. Eventually, his family invited him over occasionally and actually enjoyed having him around. At Christmas that year, his sister Alice gave him a copy of The Success Principles. He thought the gift was sort of corny, but he thanked her nonetheless and added it to his stack of books to read. Logan writes, I respect my sister, so I knew this book wouldn't be garbage. But honestly, I was far from sold. I thought, you can tell the guy's rich. How can he know what I'm going through? To my surprise, Jack seemed like a real guy. He wasn't born rich, and he satisfied my cynical side by explaining in painstaking detail the process by which normal people could actually change their lives. I read the book every day, and even did the exercises Jack suggests. Then, on March 26, 2011, at 9.11 p.m., I had an aha moment, one that will stay with me forever. As I read the chapter, Decide What You Want, I realized that in the past, I would think up ways to make money, but rarely did I focus on what I enjoyed most and what I wanted to do. With great excitement, I began to create my list. 1. Exercise. 2. Kung Fu. 3. Ride my bike. 4. Teach self-defense. When I jotted down 10. Encourage people, things suddenly clicked into place. I instantly knew what I wanted to do. Create and teach a self-defense system that would encourage and empower people. I even realized that I was uniquely suited to help others in this very specific way. For years I'd been a serious martial artist, and some time ago I'd started developing a self-defense program for women. But with my descent into alcoholism, the discipline and honor that is so vital to the martial artist had drained away along with my self-respect. In doing Jack's 20 Things exercise, I discovered that my martial arts experience, combined with my newfound energy and focus, made it possible for me to teach self-defense for a living. In fact, I was exceptionally qualified to stand up in front of a group of women and speak to them with authority and understanding. I had witnessed what happened to women on the street and in shelters. I'd seen how the strong prey on the weak. Without that experience, I'd just be an academic, someone who'd studied the martial arts but never applied them in real-life situations under duress and trauma. I realized that my unique experience, skills, and wants could all align in a single activity where I could actually make a living. It was like being struck by a thunderbolt. You can read more about Logan Doughty's heartwarming journey at www 
thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash stories. Six months after affirming his true wants, Logan left the rescue mission with a completely different perspective. No longer does he feel like a victim. Instead, he constantly looks for how the world will do him good. He treats others with compassion, tolerance, and patience. Armed with nothing but a bicycle, clothes, and the newfound knowledge that he could change his environment, Logan started a small but successful yard-cleaning business, and within months became the mission's senior self-defense instructor, teaching volunteers and staff how to deal with disruptive and potentially dangerous behavior at the facility. At the same time, he is fully developing and teaching his self-defense program full-time. As Logan puts it, I owe so much of this success to the success principles. Now I know who I am and where I'm going. And that can never be taken away. Principle 4. Believe it's possible. The number one problem that keeps people from winning in the United States today is lack of belief in themselves. Arthur L. Williams, founder of A. L. Williams Insurance Company, which was sold to Primerica for $90 million. Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich, once said, Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. In fact, the mind is such a powerful instrument, it can deliver to you literally everything you want. But you first have to believe that what you want is possible. And belief is a choice. It is simply a thought you choose to think over and over until it becomes automatic. You get what you expect. Scientists used to believe that humans responded to information flowing into the brain from the outside world. But today, they're learning instead that we respond to what the brain, on the basis of previous experience, expects to happen next. Doctors in Texas, for example, studying the effect of arthroscopic knee surgery, assigned patients with sore, worn-out knees to one of three surgical procedures, scraping out the knee joint, washing out the joint, or doing nothing. Researchers at Baylor College of Medicine, for example, recently studied the outcome of arthroscopic knee surgery on patients with painful, worn-out knees who were given one of two types of arthroscopic surgery, either scraping out the knee joint or washing it out. Their results, when then compared to patients who had unknowingly received a pretend surgery, where doctors made tiny incisions in the knee as if to insert their surgical instruments, then did nothing. Two years later... Patients who underwent the pretend surgery reported equal improvement in pain relief and knee function as those patients who had received an actual surgery. The brain expected the imaginary surgery to improve the knee, and it did. This is known as the placebo effect. Why does the brain work this way? Neuropsychologists who study expectancy theory say it's because we spend our whole lives becoming conditioned. Through a lifetime's worth of events, our brain actually learns what to expect next, whether it eventually happens that way or not. And because our brain expects something will happen a certain way, we often achieve exactly what we anticipate. This is why it's so important to hold positive expectations in your mind. When you replace your old negative expectations with more positive ones, when you begin to believe that what you want is possible, your brain will actually take over the job of accomplishing that possibility for you. Better than that, your brain will actually expect to achieve that outcome. You gotta believe. You can be anything you want to be, if only you believe with sufficient conviction and act in accordance with your faith. For whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Napoleon Hill best-selling author of Think and Grow Rich. When Philadelphia Phillies pitcher Tug McGraw, father of legendary country singer Tim McGraw, struck out batter Willie Wilson to earn the Phillies the 1980 World Series title, Sports Illustrated captured an immortal image of elation on the pitcher's mound, an image few people knew was played out exactly as McGraw had planned it. When I had the opportunity to meet Tug one afternoon in New York, I asked him about his experience on the mound that day. 
It was as if I'd been there a thousand times before, he said. When I was growing up, I would pitch to my father in the backyard. We would always get to where it was the bottom of the ninth in the World Series, with two outs and three men on base. I would always bear down and strike them out. Because Tug had conditioned his brain day after day in the backyard, the day eventually arrived where he was living that dream for real. McGraw's reputation as a positive thinker had begun seven years earlier, during the New York Mets' 1973 National League Championship season, when Tug coined the phrase, You Gotta Believe, during one of the team's meetings. That Mets team, in last place in the division in August, went on to win the National League pennant and reach Game 7 of the World Series, where they finally succumbed to the Oakland A's. Another example of his always optimistic, you-gotta-believe attitude was the time, while he was a spokesman for the Little League, that he said, Kids should practice autographing baseballs. This is a skill that's often overlooked in Little League. And then he smiled his infectious smile. Believe in yourself and go for it. Sooner or later, those who win are those who think they can. Richard Bach best-selling author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Tim Ferriss, the author of The Four-Hour Workweek, believed in himself. In fact, he believed so strongly in his abilities that he won the national Sam Shao kickboxing title just six weeks after being introduced to the sport. As a prior All-American and judo team captain at Princeton, Tim had always dreamed of winning a national title. He had worked hard. He was good at his sport but repeated injuries over multiple seasons had continually denied him his dream. So when a friend called one day to invite Tim to watch him in the National Chinese Kickboxing Championship six weeks away, Tim instantly decided to join him in the competition. Because Tim had never been in any kind of striking competition before, he called USA Boxing and asked where the best trainers could be found. He traveled to a tough neighborhood in Trenton, New Jersey, to learn from boxing coaches who had trained gold medalists. And after four grueling hours a day in the ring, he put in more time conditioning in the weight room. To make up for his lack of time in the sport, Tim's trainers focused on exploiting his strengths instead of making up for his weaknesses. Tim didn't want to merely compete. He wanted to win. When the competition day at last arrived, Tim defeated three highly acclaimed opponents before making it to the finals. As he anticipated what he would have to do to win in the final match, he closed his eyes and visualized defeating his opponent in the very first round. Later, Tim told me that most people fail not because they lack the skills or aptitude to reach their goal, but because they simply don't believe they can reach it. Tim believed, and he won. Believe, even when you don't know how the requirements will be met. Jason McDougall believed it was possible. As a wholesaler who was shipping goods to the historic Canadian department store chain Fields, his gut told him something was wrong at the retail giant. Wondering if the chain might be for sale, Jason cold-called the head of the company and asked him to dinner, never doubting the general manager would say yes. When the dinner conversation eventually turned to the question of a buyout, the general manager replied, if ever there was a time to buy, it would be now. What followed was ninety days of frantic activity for Jason, putting the deal together and coming up with the cash. For Jason and his small company, the transaction was like a minnow swallowing a whale. Not only was the retail chain thirty times the size of Jason's business, but Jason also had no idea where the money would come from. His biggest bank loan up to that point had been just $5,000. Yet still he believed, with utter conviction, that he would eventually own Fields' stores. Even when the first non-refundable deposit was due, $150,000 that Jason didn't have, his unwavering belief led him to attend a Thursday night business function where an old friend offered to give Jason the cash by Friday morning's deadline. At another stage, Jason found himself $400,000 short in making a $1 million deposit, with a deadline that was just two hours away. Using his internal guidance and steadfast belief, Jason came up with the money just minutes before the deadline passed. And just 25 days later, 
When another $12 million was due, Jason miraculously assembled two banks and six private investors, one of whom rushed through the paperwork in order to meet the funding deadline. At each stage of the transaction, as larger and larger non-refundable deposits were due, Jason had absolute faith that the deal would happen. It had to. In fact, it was either bring in the cash or lose not only the deal, but also all the money he'd paid up to that point. How did Jason maintain his unwavering belief in the face of incredible odds? He followed his own guiding philosophy that, if a thing is supposed to happen, it will. If God had put him on this path, he said, the transaction was meant to be. Of course, the fact that each deadline was met through remarkable and serendipitous means only galvanized Jason's belief that this deal was destined to close. Each small success along the way made him believe even more that victory was on the horizon. By the time the transaction was eventually completed six months later, Jason had raised tens of millions of dollars, bought an established company that was an institution in Canada, saved hundreds of jobs, and created a sizable new business for himself. All because he believed it was possible. You must find a place in yourself where nothing is impossible. Deepak Chopra, author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success It's not what you don't know that holds you back. It's what you do know that isn't true. In 1983, a 61-year-old scrawny and socially awkward potato farmer named Cliff Young entered the Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon, which was considered one of the world's most difficult physical challenges. 544 miles, 875 kilometers, of flats and hills that would take six or seven days to complete. The runners were allowed to eat and sleep as they chose, and the winner would win $10,000. When Cliff showed up in overalls and rain boots, the other runners, who were much younger and dressed in the latest Nike, Reebok, and Adidas running gear, made fun of him. The race officials were worried that Cliff might die of a heart attack but Cliff assured them that he had grown up on a farm where they couldn't afford horses or four-wheel drives, and that whenever a storm was coming in, he'd often run for two or three days without sleep in order to round up his family's 2,000 sheep on their 2,000-acre ranch. When the race started, all the other runners took off at a high speed, leaving Cliff in the dust. Cliff, however, started with a slow, loping pace and style that would later come to become known as the Cliff Young Shuffle. Now the race officials were sure Cliff would collapse and die somewhere along the route. But Cliff had a secret that no one knew about, including him. You see, Cliff had never met another long-distance runner before. He had never talked to a coach. He had never read Runner's World magazine or a book on long-distance running. He therefore didn't know you were supposed to sleep for six or seven hours a night during a long-distance endurance race. That first night, Cliff slept for only two hours. By running while the others slept, he took the lead the first night and maintained it for the remainder of the race. The next day, he ran nonstop for 23 hours, pausing to sleep for only one hour. Running with virtually no sleep for the entire race, Cliff crossed the finish line ten hours ahead of the next finisher. He had covered 544 miles in five days, 15 hours and four minutes the equivalent of almost four marathons a day, shattering the previous race record by more than two days. Cliff's story illustrates that sometimes it isn't what you don't know that stops your success. It's what you do know that isn't true. It is wise to question all of your assumptions about how things are done and be open to new possibilities. Principle 5 Believe in yourself. You weren't an accident. You weren't mass-produced. You aren't an assembly line product. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on the earth by the master craftsman. Max Lucado, best-selling author. If you're going to be successful in creating the life of your dreams, you have to believe that you are capable of making it happen. You have to believe you have the right stuff, that you are able to pull it off. You have to believe in yourself. 
whether you call it self-esteem, self-confidence, or self-assurance. It is a deep-seated belief that you have what it takes, the abilities, inner resources, talents, and skills to create your desired results. Believing in yourself is an attitude. Believing in yourself is a choice. It is an attitude you develop over time. Although it helps if you had positive and supportive parents, the fact is that most of us had run-of-the-mill parents who inadvertently passed on to us the same limiting beliefs and negative conditioning they grew up with. But remember, the past is the past. There is no useful payoff for blaming them for your current level of self-confidence. It's now your responsibility to take charge of your own self-concept and your beliefs. You must choose to believe that you can do anything you set your mind to, anything at all, because in fact, you can. It might help you to know that the latest brain research now indicates that with enough positive self-talk and positive visualization combined with the proper training, coaching, and practice, anyone can learn to do almost anything. Of the hundreds of super successful people I have interviewed for this and other books, almost every one of them told me, I was not the most gifted or talented person in my field, but I chose to believe anything was possible. I studied, practiced, and worked harder than the others, and that's how I got to where I am. If a twenty-year-old Texan can take up the luge and become an Olympic athlete, a college dropout can become a billionaire and a dyslexic student who failed three grades can become a best-selling author and television producer, then you too can accomplish anything if you will simply believe it is possible. If you assume in favor of yourself and act as if it is possible, then you will do the things that are necessary to bring about the result. If you believe it is impossible, you will not do what is necessary, and you will not produce the result. Either way, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The choice of what to believe is up to you. Consider the case of Viktor Serebryakov, the son of a Russian emigre who grew up in a London slum. Believing that he had no chance of ever finishing school or finding meaningful employment, Viktor's teachers labeled him a dunce and told him he should drop out of school. Succumbing to the destiny that others had prescribed for him, Viktor dropped out of school when he was fifteen and became an itinerant worker, moving from one dead-end job to another, often living on the streets with no aspirations other than merely surviving. When he was thirty-two, Victor joined the British Army, which gave him an intelligence test that revealed he was mentally gifted with an IQ of 161. He was a genius. Astonished by the results, Victor nevertheless decided to believe them. Once he learned that he was a genius, he decided to act like a genius. While he was in the Army, he got assigned to the Education Corps to train recruits. When he left the Army, he got a job at a timber company and eventually became the manager of a group of woodworking factories. He also became a highly respected timber technologist and revolutionized the timber industry by inventing a machine for grading timber and by introducing the metric system to the trade. He later became the chairman of a National Timber Standards Commission and held several valuable sawmill-related patents. One day his wife, Mary, spotted an advertisement for a society that was looking for people of high intelligence. Victor took the entrance test for Mensa and easily surpassed the group's only requirement for membership, an IQ of 140 or more. Again, he scored 161 putting him in the exceptionally gifted category. Several years later, this former dropout was elected chairman of Mensa International. So what made the difference in Victor's life? It wasn't that he suddenly became smart. The truth is that he was smart all along. The intellectual potential was always there. What changed was the way he chose to see himself. When he was fifteen, he chose to believe his teachers, who saw him as stupid. When he was thirty-two, he chose to believe the Army's IQ test that said he was a genius, and he released the innate potential that had always been there. Victor's story is an awesome demonstration of the power of choosing to believe in yourself and your capabilities. What potential is lying dormant in you that could be released if you just chose to believe in yourself and your abilities? 
I am looking for a lot of men who have an infinite capacity to not know what can't be done. Henry Ford, founder and CEO of the Ford Motor Company. You have to give up, I can't. The phrase, I can't, is the most powerful force of negation in the human psyche. Paul R. Sheely, co-founder, Learning Strategies Corporation. If you are going to be successful, you need to give up the phrase, I can't, and all of its cousins, such as, I wish I were able to. The words, I can't, actually disempower you. They actually make you weaker when you say them. In my seminars, I use a technique called applied kinesiology to test people's muscle strength as they say different phrases. I have them put their left arm out to their side, and I push down on it with my left hand to see what their normal strength is. Then I have them choose something they think they can't do, such as, I can't play the piano, and say it out loud. I then push down on their arm again. It is always weaker. Then I have them say, I can do it. I can play the piano, and their arm is stronger. Your brain is designed to solve any problem and reach any goal that you give it. The words you think and say actually affect your body. We see this in toddlers, for example. When you were a toddler, there was no stopping you. You thought you could climb up on anything. No barrier was too big for you to attempt to overcome. But little by little, your sense of invincibility was conditioned out of you by the emotional and physical abuse that you received from your family, friends, and teachers, and by the decisions you made in response to that until you no longer believe you can. You must take responsibility for removing I can't from your vocabulary. I once attended a Tony Robbins seminar in which we learned to walk on burning coals. When we began, we were all afraid that we would not be able to do it, that we would burn the soles of our feet. As part of the seminar, Tony had us write down every other I can't that we had. I can't find the perfect job. I can't be a millionaire. I can't find the perfect mate. And then we threw them onto the burning coals and watched them go up in flames. Two hours later, 350 of us walked on the burning coals without anybody getting burned. That night, we all learned that just like the belief that we couldn't walk on burning coals without getting burned was a lie, every other limiting belief about our abilities was also a lie. When George Danzig was a graduate student in mathematics at UC Berkeley, he arrived late for a graduate-level statistics class and found two problems written on the blackboard that he assumed had been assigned for homework, so he wrote them down not knowing that they had been written on the board as two examples of famous unsolvable statistics problems, he set out to solve them. Danzig would later recount that the problems seemed to be a little harder than usual, but a few days after he copied them down, he handed in the completed solutions for the problems, still believing they were part of an assignment that was overdue. Danzig said, If I had known that the problems were not homework, but were in fact two famous unsolved problems in statistics— I probably would not have thought positively, would have become discouraged, and would never have solved them. Danzig's story is a wonderful example of how, when you pursue your goals without any limiting beliefs about what you can accomplish, you can create unexpected and extraordinary results. Don't waste years believing you can't. On the other hand, there is the story of Catherine Lanigan, all through her childhood and teens, she was considered a gifted writer. In college, she entered the School of Journalism. During the second semester of her freshman year, she was recommended for a creative writing seminar, usually reserved for seniors, to be taught by a visiting professor from Harvard. When she wrote her first short story, the professor called her into his office to discuss her story. He was the quintessential English professor, horned-rimmed glasses, tweed coat, six foot six. He said, Come in, Miss Lanigan, sit down. He took her manuscript, threw it across his desk, and said, Frankly, Miss Lanigan, your writing stinks. She was devastated. He said, I have no idea how you got into my class. You have no concept of plot structure or characterization. There is no way you'll ever make a dime as a writer. But you are a fortunate young woman, because I have caught you at the crossroads of your life. Your parents are spending all their money on your education, and you need to change your major. 
Because it was too late in the semester for her to drop the course, he said, I know you're coming to the class with a 4.0, and I know you have declared your bid to graduate summa cum laude with highest honors. I'll make a bargain with you. I'll get you through the class, and I'll give you a B if you promise never to write again. Not seeing another choice, she took the bargain. Later that night, she took her short story and a metal waste can, went to the top of her dorm, burned the manuscript, and declared to the winter night sky, I vow I will never believe in dreams. I will deal only with reality. She then changed her major to education. For fourteen years, Catherine didn't write. But one summer, when she was in San Antonio, she noticed a group of writers and journalists sitting around one of the tables by the pool of her hotel. Summoning up her courage, she walked over to them and said, I want you to know that I really admire what you do as journalists, seeking out news stories. My secret dream was to be a writer. One of the older guys turned around and said, Is that right? Because if you wanted to be a writer, you would be a writer. Catherine replied, I have it on good authority that I have no talent whatsoever. He asked who told her that, and she told him the story of the professor. He gave her his card and told her to call him if she did any writing. She said she wasn't going to write, to which he replied, Oh, yes, you are. She thought about it, went home, wrote a book, and sent it to him. Three months later, he called and said that he liked it and had sent it to his agent, who would call in a half hour. The agent did call and said, Catherine, you are startlingly talented. Catherine signed a contract with the agency and within three weeks had two publishing companies bidding on the book. Since then, Catherine has published 33 books, including Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile, both of which were made into blockbuster movies starring Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Think about this for a moment. Catherine lost the first 14 years of what was to become a lucrative and creative writing career because she believed the professor who told her she couldn't write. Don't ever let someone else tell you what you are not capable of. With training, determination, and hard work, you can eventually do anything you set your mind to. Remember, your beliefs are a choice. So make the choice to believe in yourself no matter what anyone else says. It's never too late. It's never too late. Never too late to start over. Never too late to be happy. Jane Fonda, Academy Award-winning actress and fitness guru. One of the most common excuses people use to avoid the risk of going for their dreams is, I'm too old. It's too late for me. I didn't start soon enough. Well, it's not true. Consider this. Julia Child one of the most famous chefs in history, didn't even learn to cook until she was almost 40 and didn't launch The French Chef, the popular television show that would make her a household name, until she was 51. Susan Boyle was an unknown 48-year-old amateur when in the spring of 2009 she skyrocketed onto the international stage by belting out I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables on Britain's Got Talent. Since then, she has recorded five albums which have sold over 19 million copies, received two Grammy nominations, and amassed an estimated net worth of more than 22 million pounds, 37 million U.S. dollars. Ray Kroc was 52 after spending 17 years of his adult life as a paper cup salesman and approximately another 17 peddling a machine that could make five milkshakes at once, when he met the McDonald brothers, who owned a few great hamburger restaurants in California, and convinced them to let him help them franchise their operation on a national scale. Seven years later, Ray convinced them to sell out their shares and went on to become a billionaire. Elizabeth Jolly had her first novel published at the age of 56. In one year alone, she received 39 rejection letters, but she finally had 15 novels and four short story collections published to great success. Doris Haddock was 89 in 1999 when she began walking the 3,200 miles, 5,150 kilometers, between Los Angeles and Washington, D.C., to raise awareness for the issue of campaign finance reform.
Granny D, as she became known, walked ten miles a day on her journey, relying on the kindness of strangers for her housing and meals over the fourteen months that her walk took. In 2004, at the age of 94, she even made a bid for a seat in the U.S. Senate, making her one of the oldest candidates ever to run for a major public office. Anna Mary Robertson Moses, better known to the world as Grandma Moses, is one of the biggest names in American folk art, yet she didn't even pick up a brush until she was 76. She painted for another 25 years, which was long enough to allow her to see the canvases she had originally sold for $3 sell for more than $10,000. Today, some of her paintings sell at auction for more than $100,000. In 2007, 95-year-old Nola Oaks graduated from Fort Hay State University in Kansas with a degree in history, making her the oldest person to graduate with a college degree, breaking the record according to Guinness World Records, which had previously belonged to Moselle Richardson, who received a journalism degree from the University of Oklahoma at age 90 in 2004. Three years later, Nola went on to receive her master's degree, making her the oldest recipient of a master's degree at 98. On her hundredth birthday, Nola started writing her first book, Nola Remembers. And then, as if there was some kind of new competition, in 2011, Leo Plass graduated at 99 years old with an associate's degree from Eastern Oregon University, setting a world record for the oldest man to get a college degree. It's clear that it's never too late to do anything. From Nursing Shoes to Running Shoes When Helen Klein was 55 years old, her husband, Norm, came to her and asked her to train with him for a 10-mile run. She had been smoking for 25 years and had never run a mile in her life, but she agreed to try it out. However, panting and exhausted after running two laps on a track they had marked off in their backyard, she wasn't so sure. But she decided to continue and each day she ran one lap farther. Ten weeks later, she finished last, but she completed the ten-mile race. Spurred on by this success, Helen entered other short races, but realized she was not blessed with amazing speed, so she decided to try longer, slower marathons. Since then, she has run more than 60 marathons and 140 ultramarathons. Here are a few highlights from Helen's remarkable achievements. At age 66, she ran five 100-mile mountain trail events within 16 weeks. In 1991, she ran across the state of Colorado in five days and ten hours, setting the world record for the 500K. She also holds a world age group record in the 100-mile run. In 1995, at age 72, Helen ran 145 miles across the Sahara and also completed the 370-mile Eco Challenge, in which she rode 36 miles on horseback, hiked 90 miles through broiling desert heat, negotiated 18 miles through freezing water-filled canyons, mountain-biked 30 miles, rappelled down a 440-foot cliff, climbed 1,200 feet straight up, paddled 90 miles on a river raft, hiked another 20 miles, and finally canoed 50 miles to the finish line. She also holds the world marathon record for the 80 to 85-year-old class, completing the 26.2-mile run in 4 hours and 31 minutes. Remember that Helen had never run before the age of 55. Her story is proof that it really is never too late to start. You're never too young to start. On the flip side of the coin, many people stop themselves by telling themselves they're too young to start, or that they don't have enough experience yet to pursue their dreams. That is also a false notion. Consider this. When I was speaking at the California Women's Conference, I met 12-year-old Ryan Ross, whom the media had dubbed Tiny Trump. When he was three years old, he started a chicken and egg business in his backyard. He had 60 chickens and sold a dozen eggs for $3. He was making $15 a day. When he got tired of selling eggs, he started his next venture, a lawn mowing business. 
He charged his customers $20 an hour, but because he was too young to operate a lawnmower, he paid older kids to do the work for $15 an hour, giving him a $5 an hour profit. His next business was a power washing business for which he charged $200 an hour and paid someone $100 an hour to do the work. At the age of five, Ryan was already investing his profits in buying real estate in his hometown of Toronto, Ontario, and in British Columbia. By the time he was eight, he owned six buildings and had a personal net worth of a million dollars. Ryan also engages in philanthropy that feeds and clothes families in third-world countries. He told me he was having lunch with the real Donald Trump the following week. When Alec Greven was nine years old, HarperCollins published his first book, How to Talk to Girls, which started out as a project for school. In the year after it came out, he appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. Within the first three months, the book made it onto the New York Times bestsellers list. A year later, he published three more books, How to Talk to Moms, How to Talk to Dads, and How to Talk to Santa. A year after that, at roughly eleven years old, he published Rules for School. His books are now available in seventeen countries. And then there's the story of Ryan Hurljack. When he was six years old, he was shocked to learn that children in Africa had to walk many miles every day just to fetch water. So Ryan decided he needed to build a well for a village in Africa. By doing household chores and speaking at churches and schools on clean water issues, Ryan was able to raise enough money to get his first well built in northern Uganda by the time he was eight. Ryan's determination led to his founding the Ryan's Well Foundation, which has raised millions of dollars and has completed 878 water projects and 1,120 latrines in 16 countries, bringing access to clean water and sanitation to more than 823,000 people. Currently, 23-year-old Ryan just completed his studies in international development and political science at University of King's College in Halifax, on the east coast of Canada, and still remains active with the Foundation as speaker and a board member. And when Jalen Bledsoe was just 13 years old, he started his own tech company, Bledsoe Technologies, specializing in web design and other IT services. In two years, he grew the company from just two employees to 150 contracted workers and expanded it into a global enterprise now worth $3.5 million. There are very few adults who can say they grew their business into a multi-million dollar business in just two years. By the age of 12, Brianna and Brittany Winner had completed their first novel, The Strand Prophecy, which was distributed nationally through Barnes & Noble. By the end of the tenth grade, these identical twins had completed four novels, a screenplay, a guide to writing, and a comic book. And get this, they are both dyslexic. Don't assume you need a college degree. Here's another statistic showing that belief in yourself is more important than knowledge, training, or schooling. Twenty percent of America's millionaires never set foot in college and 16 of the 492 Americans listed as billionaires in 2014 never got their college diplomas. Two never even finished high school. So although education and a commitment to lifelong learning are essential to success, a formal degree isn't a requirement. This is true even in the high-tech world of the Internet. Larry Ellison, CEO of Oracle, dropped out of the University of Illinois and at the time of this writing, was worth $48 billion. Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of Harvard after founding Facebook, and now has a net worth of $28 billion. And Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard, and later founded Microsoft. Today he is considered by Forbes to be one of the richest men in the world, with a net worth of more than $76 billion. Even Vice President Dick Cheney dropped out of college. So when you realize that a former vice president, several of the richest men in America, and many $20 million a movie actors, as well as many of our greatest musicians and athletes, are all college dropouts, it's clear that you can start from anywhere and create a successful life for yourself. 
What others think about you is none of your business. You have to believe in yourself when no one else does. That's what makes you a winner. Venus Williams, Olympic gold medalist and professional tennis champion. If having others believe in you and your dream was a requirement for success, most of us would never accomplish anything. You need to base your decisions about what you want to do on your goals and desires, not the goals, desires, opinions, and judgments of your parents, friends, spouse, children, and co-workers. Quit worrying what other people think about you and follow your heart. I like Dr. Daniel Amen's 1840-60 rule. When you're 18, you worry about what everybody is thinking of you. When you're 40, you don't give a darn what anybody thinks of you. When you're 60, you realize nobody's been thinking about you at all. Surprise, surprise. Most of the time, nobody's thinking about you at all. They're too busy worrying about their own lives. And if they are thinking about you at all, they're wondering what you are thinking about them. Meanwhile, all that time you are wasting worrying about what other people think about your ideas, your goals, your clothes, your hair, and your home, could all be better spent focusing on doing the things that will achieve your goals. Principle 6 Use the Law of Attraction What you radiate outward in your thoughts, feelings, mental pictures, and words, you attract into your life. Catherine Ponder, author of The Dynamic Laws of Prosperity One of the most powerful forces in the universe surrounds us, affects us, and can be used to positively impact our future. Like gravity, it is not something we can turn on or off. It just is. And like gravity, we can choose to fight it, complain about it, or harness its tremendous benefits, just as successful people do. I'm talking about the law of attraction. For centuries, most people didn't know it existed, until in 2006, a documentary film and book called The Secret was released that featured me and many of my colleagues as teachers of this powerful law. I've consciously used the law of attraction to create personal success and business milestones throughout my life. And interestingly, the key practices for harnessing its power are many of the same principles and practices you're reading about in this book, the success principles, behaviors like taking 100% responsibility for the outcomes in your life, believing it's possible, visualizing your desired results, creating a vision board, repeating affirmations, acting as if, maintaining a positive expectancy, practicing forgiveness, meditating, practicing uncommon appreciation, and developing a positive money consciousness. Since The Secret and The Law of Attraction have become so much a part of our culture, let's take a few moments to discover what it is, how it works, and most important, how you can use it to create the life and results you want. Stated in its most basic form, The Law of Attraction says, What you think about, talk about, believe strongly about, and feel intensely about, you will bring about. Throughout history, the greatest minds and spiritual teachers have been pointing us to this truth. Consider the following. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11.24, King James Version of the Bible. All that we are is a result of what we have thought. Buddha. A man is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks he becomes. Gandhi. The empires of the future are the empires of the mind. Winston Churchill We become what we think about all day long. Ralph Waldo Emerson Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life, and you will call it fate. Carl Jung These great thinkers knew the power that our thoughts have over our lives, from impacting what we have to creating everything we experience even to determining our place in the world. How can mere thoughts control so many aspects of our life? Because our thoughts are made up of energy, they can impact our physical world. Today, scientists know that everything found in the universe is made up of energy. This goes for both physical and non-physical objects. 
Of course, basic chemistry tells us that a physical object, such as a building, a tree, or this book, is made up of billions of individual atoms, little energy bundles that interact and bond with other atoms into many forms including water, metals, plants, soil, plastics, wood pulp, and other raw materials used to manufacture physical objects. Non-physical things, including thoughts, are also made up of energy, and as such can also bond and interact with aspects and objects of our physical world. It is well known, for instance, that our brain waves, literally our thoughts, are a form of intense energy that can be easily detected with standard medical equipment, and that can interact with our physical world as any other form of energy would. What do I mean by interact with our physical world? Well, have you ever thought about a distant friend, only to get a phone call from her moments later? Have you ever driven down a highway wondering whether you'll get a speeding ticket, only to see flashing red lights in your rearview mirror? That's your brainwaves interacting with your physical reality. Luckily, it's possible to use your thoughts to stimulate positive outcomes, too. If you've ever desired something intensely for months, only to suddenly receive it through serendipitous means, or step into a situation where it was provided to you, that was also your thoughts, intention, and desire impacting your experience. The world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. Albert Einstein physicist and winner of the Nobel Prize. Albert Einstein studied this phenomenon in 1935 when he experimented with quantum mechanics, the idea that energetically activating a particle on one side of the universe created an instantaneous response in a partner particle elsewhere in the universe. Columbia University professor Brian Green explains it this way. According to quantum theory and the many experiments that bear out its predictions, the quantum connection between two particles can persist even if they are on opposite sides of the universe. In other words, something that happens over here can be entwined with something that happens over there. Brian Green is a professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University. His book, The Fabric of the Cosmos, was the basis for a miniseries on PBS television's NOVA program. A number of other documented experiments have also proven that thoughts can rapidly travel through space and either be picked up by others or have an effect on matter. The book Thoughts Through Space recounts an experiment in 1937 by Arctic explorer Sir Hubert Wilkins and Harold Sherman, a student of mental powers who had long been interested in the phenomenon of mind-to-mind -mind communication. The experiment began when a group of Russian flyers crashed on a shelf of ice on the Alaskan side of the North Pole. The Russian government commissioned Sir Hubert Wilkins to organize and lead an aerial search in the region to find and rescue them, if they were still alive. While in New York prior to his departure, Sir Hubert met Harold Sherman and, seeing an unusual opportunity to put mind-to-mind -mind communication to a scientific test, they decided to collaborate on a six-month experiment. It was agreed that Wilkins, once his expedition was underway, would, as an experiment separate from his rescue mission, transmit thought messages at prearranged times directly to Sherman in New York. Both men would keep written records of each session, with Wilkins noting his thoughts as the sender and Sherman recording his mental impressions in his role as the receiver. Both written records were regularly given to third parties, so the results couldn't be altered later. When Wilkins returned to the United States at the end of his expedition and showed his diary of thought messages sent to Sherman, an amazing 80% of Sherman's readings were accurate, proving that thought messages were successfully sent and received across 3,400 miles. A more recent experiment conducted by astronaut Edgar Mitchell during the Apollo 14 mission in 1971 established that thoughts could travel at least 250,000 miles, the distance from the Earth to the Moon. While in outer space, Mitchell, who holds a doctorate degree in science, transmitted a telepathic message to four individuals on Earth. Three of them received the message correctly. According to the story, one of those to whom the message was transmitted was Olaf Jonsson, an engineer and a psychic, who was living in Chicago.
At a prearranged time from inside his space capsule, Mitchell arranged a sequence of cards containing different symbols, such as a cross, a star, a wave, a circle, and a square. And Jonsson tried to picture the unknown cards from 250,000 miles away. Not only did Jonsson get all of the symbols correct, he also saw them in the correct order. Dozens of scientists have produced thousands of papers in the scientific literature offering sound evidence that thoughts are capable of profoundly affecting all aspects of our lives. As observers and creators, we are constantly remaking our world at every instant. Every thought we have, every judgment we hold, however unconscious, is having an effect. Lynn McTaggart, author of The Field, The Intention Experiment, and The Bond. Today, scientists have advanced to studying not just transmission of thoughts, but also bio-entanglement physics, discovering how to harness these energy connections to bring desired results into our physical reality. While the secret and the law of attraction have had their share of critics these past few years, I think humankind is just beginning to understand the power of thought and the theory of entanglement. Literally, that our mind is energetically entangled with the physical universe, and as such, can activate the universe to deliver whatever is on our mind. The law of attraction relies on the fact that everything is in a constant state of vibration. Another fact that's widely known by scientists is that the Earth, and everything on Earth, including you, is vibrating at a specific frequency that's unique to that object or person. From the smallest atomic particle to the largest skyscraper, everything ever created is in a constant state of vibration, literally, in energetic motion. Scientists also know that the Earth's vibrational frequency can fluctuate under intense energy, not only in areas of extreme weather, but also around worldwide events such as terrorist attacks, natural disasters, and other instances of extreme human emotion. It's not much of a stretch to realize that, through our own intense emotions, we too can raise, lower, or even match the vibrational frequencies of objects, situations, experiences, and people we want to attract into our existence. In fact, one of the main precepts of the Law of Attraction is that the level of vibrational frequency and the flow of energy is controlled by thought. Through your deliberate thoughts, you can bring yourself into vibrational harmony with, and attract, anything you desire. As best-selling author Lynn McTaggart writes, Where attention goes, energy flows. Where intention goes, energy flows. To learn more about the power of intention, read The Intention Experiment, Using Your Thoughts to Change Your Life and the World, by Lynn McTaggart. A major focus of The Secret is how to use the power of intention, that is, deliberate thought, to manifest what you want in life. It's a three-step process. Ask, believe, and receive.